Dean Stack. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I uh, was very uh, surprised in a very good way to receive the invitation and, uh, and, and I'm very, very proud to be here representing not only the Muslim community but also giving all of you a chance to, uh, to hear about some of the things that we as Muslims in our community here in South Florida are facing and are dealing with. Um, most of the things you're going to see today are things that I'm sure you're already familiar with to some extent. So there's probably nothing that's going to be really new. Well, maybe there'll be one thing, hopefully, that's kind of new. Um, but uh, most of these things are, are, I'm putting them together so that you can see them in the broader context of how they affect our community. Um, most of it's going to be self-explanatory, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to, to uh, do a good job tonight. Um, I wanted to first start off with um, uh, giving you a quick picture of what American Muslims or Muslim Americans, depending on who you talk to, what we are. Who are we? Um, so, uh, you know, Muslim Americans have been in this country for a, a very, very long time. Uh, the first documented uh, Muslim that we know of came over in the slave trade in the pre colonial days, before the American Revolution even. Um, and the first actual mosque that we know of was in 1934 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Not in Chicago, not in New York City, not in Houston, not in LA, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, in the middle of nowhere. Well, then it was the middle of nowhere. Um, and that mosque is still in existence today and is still in operation today, remarkably. Now, the Muslim American community is generally well-educated, mainly made up of doctors, lawyers. If you can't go to a hospital without finding a whole bunch of Muslim doctors, by the way. Um, and my wife is one of them, so I include her in all of that. Uh, the doctors, lawyers, engineers, professors, uh, bankers, business professionals, actors even. There's actually a young man from South Florida who uh, is, uh, is a Muslim and, and acts in a number of different things. His name is Fawad Siddiqui. He's a local, grew up in Hialeah. Uh, he's been in a bunch of TV shows, and, and including the, me, the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats with, uh, with uh, uh, George Clooney. Uh, anyway, um, I'm digressing. But we're a very wide, uh, um, widely spread out, diverse group in terms of our ethnicities, in terms of our socioeconomic status. But generally, we're fairly uh, towards the upper middle class of, of what you might expect. Now, this includes people such as Sardel Bulgari, I can never say his name properly, Bulgari, the CEO of Bulgari Holdings, which happens to own Steak and Shake, happens to be one of my favorite places. I didn't know it was owned by a Muslim until about two months ago. Um, but in, 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 in the Muslim community includes people such as NYPD Officer Khalid Latif, or this gentleman whose name I didn't catch when I was preparing this. He's a FDNY firefighter who actually responded to the World Trade Center on the morning of 9-11. Muhammad Ali, of course, one of our local homegrown favorites. We are people who serve in the military. This is Captain Muhammad Khan, the United States Navy, happens to be my cousin. Uh, and I took this picture myself on the USS John C. Stennis, where I got to spend five wonderful days on a Tiger cruise, by the way. Um, and he has been serving in the military, in the Navy, for over 25 years. His younger brother is now a lieutenant commander in the Navy and has been serving for over 10 years. Went to his graduation in Pensacola from Officer Candidate School and was never been prouder. This is, we are, we're just as ingrained in our American culture and society as the next person. We are families of victims, well, I shouldn't say victims, of, of uh, we're families, well, of victims of 9-11 as well, but families of fallen soldiers who have given their lives, who have sacrificed for our country. We are politicians, lawyers, like Keith Ellison. By the way, this Quran is, that he's thumbing through is one that was owned by Thomas Jefferson. I just threw that in because I liked it. We are 
models and beauty queens like Miss USA, Rima Fakie. And because of this picture, I have to have the next picture of my wife and kids. <laughs> Uh, that was something my wife required of me. But uh, this, this picture was actually taken in Medina, but my wife and I are born and raised in upstate New York. My kids were born here at the University of Miami. My wife is a physician and a, and a professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Um, you know, we are uh, ingrained in every aspect of society. This gentleman, Rashad Hussein, Yale graduate from Yale Law School, has a degree from Harvard in, in public affairs, a master's in public, sorry, in uh, uh, public administration. He was one of Obama's assistant White House counsel and then became Obama's hand-picked ambassador to the organization of the American, or of the Islamic Conference, the OIC. Um, and he's in his early 30s. He is a Hafiz al-Quran, which means he's memorized the entire Quran in Arabic from cover to cover. And he's probably the youngest ambassador our country has ever had. We are a politically active, law-abiding, patriotic community. We're not mooning anyone. This is people praying, by the way, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. Um, our religious practice spans the spectrum from ultra-orthodox to near-agnostic, as some people refer to themselves as Muslim in name only, or MNO. There's ABCDs, which I forget what that actually stands for, and there's MNOs. We use the letters of the alphabet for all kinds of silly things. Um, but uh, generally, the, the community is a very active, very uh, mainstream community. What you see on TV, what you see in, in images of things from the Middle East does not reflect the kind of people that live in our community. Now, I want to shift a little bit from that to, well, one thing I wanted to mention since I heard this on the radio coming in is that the Pew Center for Research just came out with a new study um, about Muslims in America 10 years after 9-11. They did one early on, right after 9-11 as well. And interestingly, they found that the views of American Muslims haven't really changed much. We're still very, 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 very against terrorism. We're still very, 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 very pro-government. We are still, well, the one thing that's changed is that under the Bush administration, we've all seemed to, the majority of Muslims under these studies felt that we were being persecuted by the government. Now, according to the study, this recent study, that, has, that trend has changed that people are a little bit more comfortable and a little bit, I shouldn't say happier, but satisfied with how the government is, is affecting the Muslim community. Well, I'll touch on that a little bit later as well, too. Um, but I want to shift a little bit to defining Islamophobia. Um, Wikipedia is, you know, of course, what it is, but one of the things that it's useful for is gathering information. So this isn't exactly what Wikipedia says. This is my paraphrasing of what Wikipedia says Islamophobia is. Um, an irrational fear, hatred, or prejudice against Islam in its entirety and or the Muslims who actually practice it. Um, another way to, to look at it from our perspective is the widespread, and I like the word irrational, so I'm going to use that too, irrational fear of Muslims, Islam, Sharia, anything related to Islam as a threat to our American way of life. Um, there's a number of different types of Islamophobia that, that we, uh, we, I wanted to look at tonight. One is what I like to call institutional or governmental uh, Islamophobia. Um, and this includes uh, a number of things, but is really focused on how our uh, federal and even sometimes our state governments have inculcated or indoctrinated themselves, to some extent, to do things that have an Islamophobic effect. Um, no matter how much the government will try and tell us that this is the war on terrorism is not a war against Islam or Muslims, and I take that at face value. Unfortunately, a lot of things that happen, but that the government actually does, are not necessarily consistent with that theme. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily why they're happening, but it has an effect. So one of the things is, for example, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in the first place. If we had the Department of Homeland Security, which I personally think is a fairly good but extremely huge bureaucracy in and of itself, would that, had that been in place before 9-11, do we really think that 9-11 would not have occurred as it did? I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure that the rules that were in place at the time, well, first of all, the rules in place at the time on, uh, 10 years ago would not have prevented it because certainly they didn't prevent it. But there are things even now 
that occur that are so similar. One of the things, for example, is airline security, right? The Transportation Security Administration, et cetera. Box cutters. The most important thing that we can think of related to 9-11 was the use of box cutters. These 19 murderers came on these planes with box cutters. About a year or two ago, there was a news report about a man who was on a plane in the US and was getting something, they were in, in flight, they were getting some, he was getting something out of his bag and out dropped a box cutter. These things get through security. Um, after the TSA had taken over, this was maybe about 2003, I was flying to New York and um, I had some trouble with those kiosks that print out your, your boarding cards, it ran out of paper. So the lady told me, okay, go over to the next one. So I used the next one. I went through security, got on my flight, sat on my seat, and here comes another passenger and says, I think you're in my seat. I said, no, I'm not. My, this is my seat. It's 9C or whatever. It was an aisle seat. And, and, and she said, no, that's mine, too. And she showed me her boarding card. The boarding card she showed me had my name on it. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I don't think you're Assad by Yunus. <laughs> she said, what? <laughs> and she looked at it. She made it through. And these were the days when they were checking IDs and doing security at the gate as well as before. She made it to, through two or three checkpoints with her ID and a boarding card that had a completely different name. So my view on it is that that really wouldn't, the whole Department of Homeland Security aspect of it was really an exercise in trying to um, focus policy more broadly on anti-terrorism, and that's had an, a, a very difficult effect on the Muslim community. No-fly lists, for example. 99% of the names on no-fly lists, and there are multiple no-fly lists, there isn't just one, you'd think, are Muslim names, and many of them are very common Muslim names. My father-in-law's name is Muhammad Amin, one of the most common, Muhammad is the most common name in the world, by the way. But Muhammad Amin, Amin is a very generic Muslim name too. He gets stopped every single time he tries to go to the airport to fly anywhere because his name, although a different date of birth and different ID number, things like that, his name alone flags their system to say, hey, this guy needs a little more scrutiny. Find out who he is. And it takes him at least an extra two hours at the airport to get through it. And he also walks with a limp because he had polio as a child and he's handicapped. So if you can imagine, here's this 60-something you know, man coming with a limp and you know, a cane, and he's being held up in security every single time. Um, interestingly, um, the late Senator Ted Kennedy was also apparently on one of these no-fly lists and got held up at Boston Logan Airport. But anyway, just to give you an idea of how ineffective these things are. Immigration policy is something that's actually has a, had a very, very broad ranging effect. The Department of Homeland Security includes the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which before it we used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, I could understand the need for it in the sense that in December of 2001, the Immigration and Naturalization Service finally approved and sent the visas for the 19 hijackers to their last known addresses here in the United States, saying, hi, you can now come in. You, your visas are, yeah. they didn't realize whose visas they had just approved, aside from the fact that they had already died, and effect, aside from who they actually were and what they had committed. So I can understand that there was some reaction to, in the government to say, okay, we need to tighten this up. But I don't think Immigration Customs Enforcement has really had the ability to do that because the priorities, while they've stayed relatively the same, they've been shifted towards anti-terrorism rather than immigration itself, immigration control. Now, what happened because of that is we have additional scrutiny for all persons from a specific list of countries. People are being selected for additional screening based on where they're coming from. Now, that in and of itself is not a problem, except when all of those countries, every single one is a majority Muslim country. There are other countries that have terrorism problems or other types of political issues that you need to scrutinize, but those aren't on the list. Every now and then another country gets on the list, another one drops off, but they're always still Muslim countries. Um, the rounding up of Muslim-only lawful immigrants. This was something that happened in 2002 and 2003 in particular. Immigration Customs Enforcement did it two ways. One, they went and actually caught people who they believed were, had overstayed visas and things of that nature, which again is not necessarily a bad thing because if they're overstaying their visas, maybe there's a reason to pick them up. But 99% of those people were Muslims or from Muslim countries. All the other demographics were generally ignored. Why is that? 
The other thing that happened is that they asked those who were lawfully in the country to come for voluntary interviews. And if you didn't come to one of these interviews, you'd have an ICE agent knocking at your door with a pair of silver handcuffs. So, and a number of people went in to those interviews and didn't come back out. They ended up going back to whatever country they, were, they had come from, even though they were here legally. So, Again, and this was focused largely, almost exclusively, on the Arab and Muslim communities in the United States. Um, lawyers, in fact, immigration lawyers, were going bonkers trying to keep up with them because these people did not have a right to counsel in these voluntary interviews. So you never even knew what your clients, who may, you, you may have helped them get a visa, are going through now. Um, there was no right to file for asylum and challenge these detentions or anything half the time because you didn't even know they happened. Um, there have been delays and blocking legitimate and reasonable applications for U.S. citizenship. There are people, in, including people in this room who I know of, who specifically have, they in fact, have filed lawsuits. There, been, there was a whole bunch of lawsuits filed out of the Southern District of Florida against Immigration Customs Enforcement for denying or delaying the citizenship applications specifically of Muslims or people from Muslim countries. Um, refusing re-entry to Muslim American citizens. This is something that's been happening all the time, especially in our generation. There are people who may go abroad for um, a semester or two semesters or something, either to do a cultural study in Jordan, or somebody wants to go learn Arabic in Syria, although well, Syria might be a bad place to go right now, or, or Egypt, or other places like that. And they're going there learning, they're, they've finished their, their studies, and they're coming back to rejoin their studies here and they're, they're lawful U.S. citizens, born and raised here, and they aren't allowed back in the in, inside the border and sent back to that country, even though they're not a citizen of that country. That country says, what are you doing back? Your visa is expired. You're not longer supposed to be here either. Now they're stateless, in a matter of speaking, but they're still citizens of the, of the United States, but they're being denied entry into their own country. Um, national and local law enforcement indoctrination of Islamophobic concepts. Now this is something I don't really blame local and national law enforcement for as much. I blame the people who are doing the training. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video um, here. Let's see if I can pull it up. Um, from CNN. I'm going to only play a few seconds of it, hopefully. Uh, about a, a guy named Walid Shobat, who is a terrorism trainer and goes around talking to law enforcement uh, all over the country. I'll tell you why this is on CNN as soon as it's done. Full disclosure, one time or another, CNN and other networks have turned to Shabbat for his perspective on the war on terror, a turn look from the inside. But keep it modest tonight, we're discovering that while each Shabbat story just doesn't seem to add up. For CNN's Drew Griffin of CNN's Special Investigation Team. I think we are at war with Islamic fundamentalism and Islamism, which stems from Islam. You know, no historian can deny that Islamists basically invaded Christendom. Walid Shubat's message is the epitome of good versus evil. He has an advertised pedigree that makes him an expert. The Islamic terrorist turned ultra-conservative Christian. A U.S. citizen because his mother is American, he is a darling on the terror circuit, the church and university circuits, and yes, he believes the war on terror is a holy war. He portrays himself as a man converted and on a mission. Once a Jew-hating, bomb-throwing terrorist, now a devout Christian convert warning the world, Islam is out to destroy you. <laughs> That's how you start the Quran. I know the Quran inside out. English. And if you meet the unbelievers, then smite off their necks. What part of smite off their necks? The Americans don't understand. His message before a largely positive crowd of cops and emergency responders at this South Dakota Homeland Security Conference, trust no Muslim especially those who organize. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. All Islamist organizations in America should be the number one enemy. All Islamist organizations, Islamist society of America should be focused on. You got it? Now, I wanted to stop here. <clears throat> I'm going to move to a different clip, but I wanted to point out some of the things he's saying. First of all, 
Uh, what, just for full disclosure, um, he just pointed out the Islamic Society of North America should be focused on. I'm one of the board members of the Islamic Society of North America. It was founded in 1963, um, one of the oldest and most mainstream and most respected organizations in the country. But basically, Mr. Shobat, his teaching, his education of law enforcement is to say anyone, anyone in the Muslim community who organizes in any shape or form should be public enemy number one for law enforcement. They should be suspect because they're organizing at all, which seems rather unusual. Um, but the reason why it was on CNN was because C Anderson Cooper and his, and his investigative uh, colleagues there managed to discover that everything that Mr. Shobat uses as his credentials turns out to be fake. He claims, as you saw at the very beginning of it, to be a, a former terrorist who apparently, and if you watch the clip longer, uh, had apparently uh, participated in the bombing of a Tel Aviv uh, or a Jerusalem bank. The bank is still there. Um, there was no bombing. He was never a terrorist. His family members in Palestine say, no, he was a good guy. He went to the States to study. He wasn't involved in any of this stuff. And he comes here and he says he's a converted Christian, a former terrorist, and an expert on terrorism. And that's who's talking to our police officers. And there are others like that out there, too, um, who create their own resume and then go out there and try and indoctrinate um, law enforcement for some reason to get them to be completely against Muslims and Islam in, an, in its entirety. He, you, you heard him talking about Quranic verses. He's actually suggesting that the Holy Scripture itself is advocating for the types of things that terrorists do, and therefore mainstream Muslims are going to have to follow the Quran, and they're going to do these types of things too. Unfortunately, he's completely misquoting and misinterpreting everything in, in the Holy Scriptures. Now. Uh, the next slide I want to show you, um, well, one of the things also, actually, it follows from what's on here. Um, Anti-Sharia bills in state legislatures. You may have heard about the, the bill currently in the Florida legislature. There's about t almost 20 other bills around the country uh, that specifically outlaw Sharia and, uh, or foreign law also, as they call it, especially in the Florida one. But what's interesting is to know who is doing this and why. Um, the, there was also, in Tennessee, actually, they had passed a bill that made it a criminal act to follow the Sharia. That was struck down very quickly by the federal courts. Oklahoma had a bill that just made it illegal, um, but didn't have a criminal penalty. And that was struck down, for, by, at least temporarily, by a federal court also. Um, but this is David Yershalami, uh, who is from the Society of Americans for National Existence. This is the man who's drafted pretty much every single or at least contributed to every single bill currently in various state legislatures. And I wanted you to, to hear from him a little bit to see why he's doing these things. Since we've come to understand that Sharia as a legal doctrine and system is objective and knowable, certainly in the Muslim world, and we've also come to understand that it is an existential threat to our way of life. It calls for jihad. It calls for death to apostates. If a person wants to leave Islam, the capital, it is a capital crime. We've understood that if you blaspheme Muhammad, it is also a capital crime. Those are the laws applied in places like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Iran, any place where Sharia exists. So if that is in fact the Sharia that is being applied in a state or federal court, then the answer has to be no. Sharia law should not apply here. That's no different from any other form. Now, <clears throat> the, by the way, it got cut off at the end. It says, that's no different than any other foreign law. One of the things that Mr. Yerushalami argues, and I didn't obviously put the whole clip. This is an interview from, for the New York Times that he gave. Uh, they're online. You can actually find it on NewYorkTimes.com. Um, he goes on to argue, essentially, that we don't want this type of draconic uh, legal system to be implemented in our legal system, which, first of all, it can't be according to the, the Constitution Supremacy Clause. But he goes on to cite examples of where Islamic law or cultural law or foreign law has been used, such as contract law that applies uh, uh, law, the legal system of a different country or of a different system, and the courts are bound by what's in the contract or by a treaty or something like that. And what happens is that he seems to make a jump from these things that he's really afraid of, like jihad related stuff like apostasy like blasphemy laws that um, have you know very serious uh, Islamic legal uh, punishments attached to them um, and tries to say that that 
would somehow come into play if we allowed people to do things for, such as inheritance law or family law or things of that nature that don't apply to the general public. They apply to a specific litigant in a specific case. Um, and so the, the other problem is that his entire argument falls because, as I mentioned, the supremacy clause of the United States would never allow the types of things that Sharia, specifically these guys are claiming Sharia has in it, to be applicable in our, in our courts. If you could, can you imagine a, 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 an assistant state attorney trying to prosecute somebody for apostasy and trying to get the death penalty? First of all, apostasy is not a, a, a violation of Florida state law. There is no way that a religious law on apostasy could ever be enforced in criminal court. And on top of that, you'd never be able to get the death penalty for something like that in Florida. It's complete, complete lunacy. Um, now, going back a slide, I want to also touch on some office holders because we're talking about institutional Islamophobia. We have uh, Representative Allen West, our hometown, no, really hometown, I guess local, uh, local, I don't know the right adjective to use. <laughs> um, I'll just call him the local representative, I don't know. Um, and I want to play a little bit of some of his, his, uh, his what goes in his, through his mind at least. Um, because it's very, very interesting. But it'll give you an idea of what, uh, where he's coming from. Let me skip ahead to the actual answer he gives because I don't, there's too much stuff here that is really sure, useless. Like the Thomas Drive, the debate that other people see every day, how do you answer that? How do you explain to them why she's wrong? Hopefully there are other voices out there that are, that are rational and uh, they can explain it. In there was a Marine said. who was asking a question about how do you how do you counter the Islamic threat? I don't care about being popular, whatever. But the first thing you got to do is you got to study and understand who you're up against. And you must realize that this is not a religion that you're fighting against. You're fighting against a theopolitical belief system and construct. You're fighting against something that's been doing uh, this thing since 622 AD, 7th century, 1388 years. You want to dig up Charles Martel and ask him why he was fighting the Muslim army at the Battle of Tours in 732? You want to ask the uh, Venetian fleet at Lepanto why they were fighting a Muslim fleet in 1571? You want to ask the Christian, uh, I mean, the, the Germanic and Austrian knights while they were fighting at the gates of Vienna in 1683. You want to ask people what happened in Constantinople and why today is called Istanbul because they lost that fight in 1453. You need to get into the Quran. You need to understand their precepts. You need to read the, uh, the Surah. You need to read the Hadiths. And then you can really understand this is not a perversion. They are doing exactly what this book says. So... <clears throat> His essential message is that don't trust Muslims, be afraid of Muslims, and, and uh, ostracize Muslims because they have been violent for centuries, and they always will be. Forget about the people living next door. Um, now, Mr. West has gone on record saying a number of other things, and we've seen his temper flare in, in non-Islamophobic con uh, uh, contexts as well, such as with uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I think we all have a pretty good flair for the kind of personality he is. But the problem is there are a lot of people who believe him, and there are a lot of people who listen to him, um, and there are a lot of people who take what he says to heart because they think he's right. Um, and that's one of the things that we really have to counter. Now, this next clip, and I'm, I'm only going to play a little bit of this uh, just to give you an idea of where it's coming from. I hope you recognize this gentleman um, who once had supported the Irish Republican Army. Um, the, I shouldn't say that at the beginning, should I? This is Congressman uh, Peter King uh, from New York, from Long Island specifically. And his, he's the chairman of the House Home, uh, Homeland Security Committee. And this was the first, the opening statement for the first of, I think, three now hearings he's had on the radicalization of American Muslims. Again, this being from Congress, that's one of the reasons I'm making a, a big deal of it. For an opening statement. The very outset, let me thank all the witnesses. If you don't mind, I'm going to skip through some of the thanks he gives a little bit. Today's hearing will be the first in a series of hearings dealing with the critical issue of radicalization of Muslim Americans. I am well aware that the announcement of these hearings has generated considerable controversy and opposition. Some of this opposition 
such as my colleague and friend, Mr. Ellis, and Mr. Pasquale, has been measured and thoughtful. Other opposition, both in special interest groups and the media, has ranged from disbelief to paroxysms of rage and hysteria. Let me make it clear today that I remain convinced that these hearings must go forward, and they will. To back down would be a craven surrender to political correctness and an abdication of what I believe to be the main responsibility of this committee to protect America from a terrorist attack. Despite what passes for conventional wisdom in certain circles, there is nothing radical or un-American in holding these hearings. Indeed, congressional investigation of Muslim American radicalization is the logical response to the repeated and urgent warnings which the Obama administration has been making in recent months. Just this past Sunday, for instance, Dennis McDonough, the Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama, made a major speech on radicalization, stating that, quote, Al-Qaeda and its adherents have increasingly turned to another troubling tactic, attempting to recruit and radicalize people to terrorism here in the United States. For a long time, many in the U.S. thought that we were immune from this threat. That was false hope and false comfort. This threat is real and it is serious. Ms. McDonough went on to say, Al-Qaeda does this for the express purpose of trying to convince Muslim Americans to reject their country and attack their fellow Americans. In the now, <clears throat> oh, hold on a second. I'll get to this in a second, too. Um, the... Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight here was Mr. King's, um, and he's quoting, of course, Dennis McDonough, but his, his belief that, um, that because Al-Qaeda is supposedly trying to reach into the American Muslim community, the American Muslim community is now a threat automatically. He doesn't see it from the perspective that maybe Al-Qaeda is threatening the American Muslim community. By the way, one of the things you should know, over the past 10 years, Al-Qaeda, through Osama bin Laden and then Ayman al-Zawahiri, has made it very, very, very clear that Muslims in America, living in America, participating in our system, are non-Muslims and should be killed. So I, standing here as, an, as a Muslim American, am a target of Al-Qaeda, just as anybody else may be. And that, if nothing else, makes me more against them than I could have possibly imagined. Because now they're singling out the Muslim community and saying, because you're living in, uh, in the West, because you're living in the United States, because you're supporting this, this regime with your tax dollars and participating in it and voting and, and being part of the community, you are a target. Well, you know what? I would gladly paint a bullseye on my back if that's what it takes. Because I'm a born and raised American citizen, and I love this country, and I will fight to the death to protect it. And I don't know a single Muslim in this country who would disagree with me on that. Now, um, the next thing I want to talk about was um, public Islamophobia. And this is... Um, more so in terms of protests and things of that nature. And I'm going to switch it to this video that I was just starting right here. Um, because this is something that, that's becoming an, an increasing problem uh, within our communities across the country. Uh, this video is of a protest organized by a Tea Party group in Yorba Linda, California, that was protesting a fundraiser, as you can see, by a relief organization to raise money for women's shelters in the United States and to relieve homelessness and hunger. So take a look, and some of this is rather nasty, but um, in terms of what they say, let me skip uh, to some of <laughs> These are Muslim families, children coming uh, to the actual event with their parents, of course. And if you can make out what they're saying, they're saying, go back home. You're, 
you're going to see in a few minutes or in a few seconds a local elected official also address the group. And that's where I'm going to stop it is after she talks. But I want to uh, highlight that a little bit as a, as a segue. <laughs> What's going on over there right now? Make no bones about it. That is pure, unadulterated evil. By the way, what were they doing in that room, in that, in that hall? They were raising money for women's shelters and for homelessness, to, get, to help wipe out homelessness and hunger. That is what they were calling pure, unadulterated evil. I don't care who's doing it. I think the concept of, uh, uh, well, it's just self-explanatory. I think you all get it. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit to a couple other scenes here of, of what happened here. Um, again, kids. Why don't you go beat up your wife like you do every night? This is what these people are, are, believe that we do. I, I'm going to show you another clip in a few minutes of what happened in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. But um, uh, I want to shift a little bit to um, another form of Islamophobia in the public, which is actually having a much more stronger effect. And that is things such as presidential candidates and politics. <laughs> these are people who are not necessarily in office right now, so I didn't want to lump it with the other part. <clears throat> but this is our Mr. Ken, favorite a bit of Godfather's Pizza. This week for some of the comments you made uh, about Muslims in general, mm -hmm. would you be comfortable appointing a Muslim either in your cabinet or as a uh, federal judge? No, I will not. And here's why. There is this creeping attempt, there is this attempt to gradually ease Sharia law and the Muslim faith into our government. It does not belong in our government. This is what happened to Europe. And little by little, to try and be politically correct, they, you know, they made this little change. They made this little change. And now they've got a social problem that they don't know what to do with hardly. Now, the next clip I want to show you is also Herman Cain, but on a slightly different topic. And this will segue us into Murfreesboro, Tennessee. This interview, uh, and I, I forget this guy's name. I think it's Chris Wallace, but I don't think that's right, um, from Fox News, is about some comments he said, uh, Herman Cain said about the mosque in, uh, the mosque project in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which you may have heard of. It was profiled on The Daily Show. By the way, can I just say, the best source of I guess straight reporting out there these days is The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. I, I mean, not only does he show you what's actually going on, but he shows you why you should make fun of it. Anyway, um, here's Herman Cain again. I guess is, this isn't ground zero in New York City. It's not hallowed ground. Don't Americans have a right of whatever religion under the Constitution, which you speak so much about, to free speech and freedom to worship. To the people in Murfreesboro, Borough, it is hallowed ground. Uh, objecting to the, the intentions of trying to get Sharia law. Now, that judge may rule, but this case isn't over with yet. I believe it's going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. It's not hallowed ground. It's hallowed ground to the people in Murfreesboro. But, but couldn't any community then say, we don't want a mosque in our community? They could say that, Chris, let's go back to the fundamental issue that the people are basically saying that they're objecting to. They objected to the fact that Islam is both a religion and a set of laws, Sharia law. That's the difference between any one of our other traditional religions where it's just about religious purposes. The people in the community know best. And I happen to side with the people in the community. So you're he seems to not realize that there's also halakha, which is Jewish law, there's canon law, which is Catholic law, that all has an entire legal system attached to it. But for some reason, Sharia is the only one that seems to bother Mr. Kane. Anyway, um, 
I, I, we're getting a little short of time, so I want to show you one more clip, and I'm going to go through, through some pictures really quick also and some other very important stuff related to the causes and the response of Islamophobia. Um, this is part of a, uh, not that, but this is part of a CNN um, special that just re-aired actually this past week. Um, but this, this one is actually focused on the Murfreesboro, Tennessee lawsuit. And I want you to hear a little bit about what they said, uh, the lawyer for the, for the plaintiffs trying to block the, the building. Can you envision in your wildest dreams how something could be called a religion that promotes the abuse physical abuse of women. I wouldn't call it a religion, but I'm not the one that makes the definition of what is a religion. In a small courtroom in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Islam was on trial. I've been under the impression that Islam has been a religion for thousands of years, whether I agree with it or not. You know, if it was Sharia real law, you wouldn't even be out here right now. The planned construction of a new Islamic center had divided this small city. They should have a free... So the, the, the plaintiffs in this lawsuit basically were arguing that, that Islam is not a religion, it's a cult, it's a, uh, a, a really crazy militant philosophy that would bring nothing but radicalism and terrorism to this tiny little sleepy town of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, by the way, in the end, the judge uh, th uh, ruled against the plaintiffs and, uh, and allowed the, the construction to continue. It was then approved by the circuit court and now the plaintiffs are appealing it again. Um, to a higher court. Um, now, what I want to get back to, the, I want to segue a little bit to another pro uh, thing that you may have heard about, was, which was the Ground Zero Mosque, so-called Ground Zero Mosque, which is actually called Park 51. Um, and it's and not even a mosque. It's an interfaith community center. And, com and by community center, I mean that it has a gym, it has an art gallery, it has classrooms, it has a uh, multi-denominational meeting and prayer space. Anyway, um, but these are some people, people who protested at, uh, in front of uh, the Cordoba House, which is what it's currently called, in Lower Manhattan. Um, I had some video, which I'm going to skip, because it basically says all these same things. These are some of the things that people put up there. Building a mosque at Ground Zero is like building a memorial to Hitler at Auschwitz. All I, this is my favorite. All I need to know about Islam, I learned on 9-11. <laughs> I mean, it, this one was there too, by the way. I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, locally, uh, we had, um, if you, I don't know if you, many of you may remember this, uh, Reverend O'Neill Dozier in Pompano Beach was objecting to the building of a new mosque in Pompano Beach to replace an existing mosque. There's an existing mosque for the Islamic Center of South Florida, and they had, they've been there for about 25 years. They were outgrowing their space, so they were going to sell their property and build a brand new one. Well, Reverend Dozier had an issue with that, and so they filed a lawsuit. Uh, in which, with the help of other well-known Islamophobes here in South Florida, like Joe Kaufman, um, they basically claimed that the people who would be running this mosque are radicals, terrorists, extremists, etc. And um, the judge in the case, the Broward, uh, Broward Circuit judge, threw out the case. There was a motion to dismiss, and he granted the motion to dismiss against the plaintiffs, saying basically that this was nothing more than a, a sham. It was all just you know, a hate-filled speech and didn't belong in a courtroom. Of course, then we have our favorite handlebar mustached pastor, Terry Jones, from Gainesville, Florida, and his burn a Quran day. By the way, I don't know if you remember, he didn't end up burning a Quran on 9-11 last year. He ended up actually burning it um, in March of this year. I mean, that really didn't even hit the media. It did internationally, and five UN workers in Afghanistan lost their lives in violence related to that. Um, but in March, Mr. Jo or Pastor Jones um, held a mock trial of the Quran. I don't think it had adequate representation of counsel in this trial <coughs> or the right to defend itself, but um, he found it guilty. He was the prosecutor, the judge, the jury. He found it guilty, and as its sentence, decided to burn it. And that's not a, cop a picture of the one that he burned. It's just a random picture. Then, of course, we have people uh, who like to talk about Muslims and Islam in the negative light, such as our good friend Glenn Beck. By the way, one of the pictures I was going to use for him is from a, a cover of his book, which I forgot the name of the book itself, but it has him dressed as a Nazi SS soldier. I didn't understand that. 
except the concept of maybe he's trying to demonstrate his inner persona. I don't know. But he, <laughs> that might be going a little far. But um, both of them, you know, Bill O'Reilly actually cost Juan Williams his job at NPR, uh, which was probably a bit of an over-exaggeration. I was going to show you the clip of that, but most of you probably remember, because that relates to the hysteria of Muslims flying while being Muslim. I don't know how else to describe it. I fly like this. I, if somebody thinks that I'm trying to make myself look Muslim because of my beard or you know, how I look, that's not something I can control. My wife wears a headscarf you saw in those pictures earlier. She considers that a part of her religion, not a part of telling people who she is. But Mr. Williams and people such as Bill O'Reilly felt that that was something that was provocative. Um, now, I want to touch very quickly on the co possible causes of Islamophobia. There's the exaggerated perception of the threat caused by terrorists. Now, let me say, the threat, caused, or the threat posed by Al-Qaeda and terrorists is not in and of itself exaggerated. It is real. But the perception that it extends to the Muslim community here in the United States is exaggerated, and that is what is causing one of the causes of fear and hatred of the Muslim community. Financial, and I'm going to show you a little clip in a second. Over $40 million from major nonprofit foundations supporting Islamophobic causes. It's called the Islamophobic Network by the Center for American Progress. I'll show you that in a second. Political, the Park 51, the Ground Zero Mosque debate was centered right, or it took place right before the last congressional election. It's no surprise that that's when it happened because it was a big issue. There, in fact, I, I have a, a, a clip I was going to show you, which was an actual campaign ad by a, a, a local man running for Congress in New York City who, was, who used the a clip of his competitor supporting the Ground Zero Mosque as the only text, the only content of his ad saying, don't vote for that guy because I know what's better. I wouldn't let these people build their mosque here. Um, so, but the Park 51 controversy died the day after election day, 2010. Never heard, from, heard about it again. Occasionally, they still have a protest or two, like five or six people in, in lower Manhattan. But, um, but then you have about 25 or 40 or 50 or 100 people who come in support of it in, in response. So, but um, nationally, it's gone off the, the public scene. Pre President Obama mentioned it last year in Ramadan, in fact, because he mentioned it during the, the White House iftar. This year, we've already had the White House iftar. It's gone from the, from the radar screens because it was a polarizing issue. Um, and then, of course, there's one-sided media coverage that focuses on the sensational stories because that's driven by market forces. The, the CNNs and the, the cable news channels of the world, they have to make money. And if they have a nice story about how a Muslim community got together and fed the homeless every week, uh, there's a project here called Project Downtown, started at University of Miami, has spread throughout the entire country, of Muslim students going out and um, feeding homeless people every single week. They covered that. Nobody's going to watch it. Their advertisers aren't going to care. But if they have sensational coverage of angry people in Afghanistan burning US flags, people are going to tune in and watch it. And that's what's going to bring in the advertisers. Um, now, this is the last clip I wanted to show you very quickly, because this is something that goes to the core of what, what is causing all of this. Islamophobia Network is a small group of pseudo-experts who have been trying to convince America that there's a danger of Muslim presence in this country. It's comprised largely of five core individuals, David Yerushalmi, Frank Gaffney, Robert Spencer, Daniel Pipes, and Stephen Emerson. Those individuals have been working for decades to try to convince people that uh, there's a creeping Sharia threat in this nation, that mosques are a, a dangerous presence in America, and that Muslims are not holding core American values. This group has been funded uh, by a core group of eight uh, foundations for the better part of the last decade. Uh, they've received over $40 million from these core foundations to do the work that they've done, and together they comprise the Islam. The, the Islamophobia network is what he was about to say. Um, so this entire movement of Islamophobia has been really well funded by some very not well-known sources. Um, and there's now suddenly a, a push to try and find out who these people are. Now, the response from the community is something I really wanted to wrap up with. Um, the Muslim community, unfortunately, has not been able to effectively deal with this because it's coming to, at us from all sides. And we really don't know how to handle this. It's, you, somebody's saying that your belief system is flawed and is wrong and is, is criminal. 
that something that, how do you respond to that? Um, so the biggest area that we've been able to connect with is our interfaith partners and interfaith projects that we're working in. We're working in. Um, but it's had a very little effect on public opinion because it really doesn't get out there. Um, the other thing we really try and do is to recenter the image of Muslims and Islam in, in, the, in our community. But unfortunately, the biggest problem we run into is there really is no outlet to carry this, this message to the public. Um, this is a national campaign called the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign on 9-9-2010, last year, two days before 9-11. They had this, this meeting at the National Press Club. The, um, the gentleman right there, that is the, pres the, now, the now president of the Islamic Society of North America. Um, and uh, I don't know who the rest of the, the Muslims are in there, but I, I can tell you all the rest of these are, pa are, are priests, rabbis, uh, pastors, etc., of about 20 different national religious organizations. Um, and they come out and said, Look, we call upon our fellow citizens to treat each other with compassion and honesty and to foster an ethical commitment to bedrock American values such as pluralism and religious freedom, mutuality and respect, values also at the core of our religious traditions. And they stand there and say, we're going to be there with our Muslim colleagues and our Muslim neighbors and our Muslim community front members to show that we're all united together and we're not going to stand for this type of racism and intolerance. Now, the problem with this project is it hasn't gotten any, any press. Nobody even knows it exists. They just launched their website last week, which was this one. Um, and you know what it leads to is a, an absence of knowledge of what's going on. So one of the things we've done here in South Florida is we have this group called the, the uh, Coalition of South Florida Muslim Organizations, as the acronym we came up with is COSMOS. It misses a few letters like Florida. <laughs> I didn't come up with a name. Um, but basically, it's a coalition of organizations, including mosques, political organizations, advocacy groups, including the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Emerge USA political organization, um, a, a community service organization such as a, a free clinic that we have in our community, and a domestic violence shelter we have in the community, um, and pol uh, to, to reach out to prominent media outlets, interfaith partners, political and governmental agencies, law enforcement, and the community in general to sensitize them. By the way, this language is all from their own website. To sensitize them about the presence of the American Muslim community, its nature, and its role in American society in order to build bridges and bring peace and tolerance to our community. Now, that sounds like a lot. But what we've managed to do, and as I mentioned, uh, actually as, as Dean Stack mentioned earlier, I'm the, uh, the legal advisor to this organization, Cosmos. Uh, what, what they do is that they compartmentalize. There are certain people from the community who are specialists in the media, certain who are specialists in politics, certain ones who are specialists in community activism, community organizations, and community service. And we use them to connect with service providers of those various areas in the community. So one of the things we did is that we've managed to meet with every editorial board of every media outlet, whether it's all of the local TV stations, Channel 7, Channel 6, Channel 10, Channel 4, Miami Herald, um, WLRN, um, the uh, Sun Sentinel. And whenever they have any issue that they need a Muslim opinion on or affecting the Muslim community, they come to us. And what that allows us to do is allows us to shape the message that's going out to all of the, the media and all of the community. For example, we have, you, you might remember just a couple months ago there was the arrests of the two imams uh, here at the, in the, what we call the Flagler Mosque. I became the, the de facto spokesperson along with Nizar Hamzi from the Council of American Islamic Relations. And we together had a unified message and we handled every single media request between the two of us. So there's only one or two people handling this and the message stays consistent. You don't have people, random people screaming and yelling and oh no they did this in our mosque and things like that. You have a, a concerted effort to have a unified message and that shows not only professionalism but it shows the community that the, it gives us the opportunity to make sure that the message we want which is that of condemnation of the types of actions alleged in the complaint is, is made clear, 
as well as our support for the Muslim community itself and for the, the, the legal process, the, the, the right to be uh, innocent until proven guilty. And those were things that were very, very important to us. We wanted to make sure we could get out ahead of the story. And our relationship with law enforcement, the FBI and the US Attorney's Office actually gave us a chance to get ahead of that story. They called us the morning of the arrests before they announced it and said, hey, this is what we did. Don't be mad at us. Here's the why. We want you to have time before we announce it. And so we were able to get organized. And by, when the first media call came in, we already had our press release ready to go and had a plan of action. So it's, it's a very important um, uh, opportunity to actually shape the message. Now the thing is, this only comes into play when there's something that happens, like an arrest or a, an incident somewhere. Our attempts to try and reach out to these institutions and get them to proactively give a good message has not come to fruition yet. And we're hoping that our interfaith partners will, uh, will really be able to do that. Um, but what it comes down to is that we really need all of your help, educators, students, people who are active in the community, to go out there and really help us connect with the community uh, and know who the resources are and where to go to get the, the proper information because we don't want misinformation for coming from all those sources of Islamophobia that you saw uh, to, to rule the day. Um, this is my contact information. If anybody has any questions, wants to talk to me, uh, anything like that, please feel free. I thank you very, very, very much for your time. I'd like to, to, to thank FIU and, and the, the school uh, in particular, uh, as well as Dean Stack and, and, and Pedro Bota and the rest of the staff here. Thank you very, very much. I don't know if we have time for questions and answers.